Minister. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr Doug Ferguson, who is the National Managing Partner for Asia for KPMG. He's on the advisory board of the Asia Society. And he, uh, with his uh, National Managing Partner for the whole firm, Mr Wingrove, who's here today, been great supporters of the Society, and we thank you for that, uh, Doug. Uh, Doug um, is a uh, university trained in uh, languages and accounting. He spent 12 years uh, working in Beijing, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan on M&A transactions uh, for KPMG. He's the author of uh, quite a number of investment reports uh, about Chinese investment activities, uh, some done in conjunction with Sydney University, of which I'm sure some of you have seen. And um, he's been a great supporter and he epitomises an Australian who is engaged with Asia in the services sector, manages many, many accounts, some of which are in this room, with excellence and quality, and we thought that he would be an example of what Australia can achieve and needs to achieve into the future in developing our trade profile. Please welcome Doug Ferguson. Thank you very much, Warwick, for those very kind words and warm intro. I congratulate you and your team for successfully arranging this timely and important event ahead of the Commonwealth Government-sponsored North Asian Tour. Prime Minister, His Excellency the Ambassador of Japan, His Excellency the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea, Minister Councillor of the People's Republic of China, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a tremendous honour to be invited to introduce the Prime Minister of Australia on behalf of the Asia Society today. There is no doubting the importance of the joint government and business delegation which the Prime Minister is personally leading in early April. China, Japan and South Korea rank first, second and third in terms of Australian export partners in 2012-13. Together, they accounted for over $155 billion worth of goods and services export and 51% of our total export base. The opportunities to further increase trade exports of minerals, gas, food and services are truly exciting and free trade agreements are an important mechanism to achieve that. In doing so, these should deliver vast job creation in Australia and enable Australia to generate growth and sustainable wealth in the future. There is an awareness of the urgency to attract more North Asian investment in an increasingly competitive global environment. This North Asian delegation, personally led by our Prime Minister and the Trade and Investment Minister, is a clear demonstration to foreign governments and corporations in North Asia of Australia's genuine commitment to welcoming more investment. It also reinforces the importance of Asia back here in Australia. Since coming to office in September 2013, the federal government has been incredibly focused on presenting a welcoming, consistent and comprehensive policy platform to both encourage Australian trade and investment and also to assist Australian companies successfully operate in the region. These commitments have been backed up with real action to repeal the mining and carbon taxes, reduce red tape and deliver free trade agreements are some fine examples of significant progress being made on core issues. It is now my tremendous honour to introduce the Honourable Tony Abbott MP, Prime Minister of Australia. Please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister. Well, thanks very much, Doug. Your Excellencies, uh, parliamentary colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on the eve of this exceedingly important trip to North Asia, it is an honour to address the Asia Society, which has been a leader in promoting the relationships between Australia and the rest of Asia since its establishment 
in 1997. This society understands the importance of trade to improving the understanding between nations. Every time one person freely trades with another, wealth increases, and when wealth increases, countries grow stronger. Trade is an essential part of building a stronger and more prosperous economy and a safer and more secure Australia. International trade builds the economies of two countries, the seller and the buyer, and makes both of them stronger and more secure. So along with getting the budget under control, scrapping bad taxes and cutting red tape, fostering freer trade is part of this government's economic plan. When I said on election night that Australia was once more open for business, I meant business with our trading partners as well as business amongst ourselves. So in a fortnight, I will lead trade missions to Japan, Korea and China. This will be my first official visit to North Asia and it's happening very early in the new government's term. Trade means jobs. It means more and better jobs here in Australia and in the countries we do business with. Serendipitously, this year marks the 80th anniversary of Australia's first ever diplomatic mission and the destination was also Asia. In 1934, the then Lyons government's Minister for External Affairs, Sir John Latham, whose picture, I'm happy to say, hangs in the anteroom of the Coalition Party Room in Parliament House, embarked on what he called a goodwill mission to Asia. It was Latham who called Asia and not the Levant, Australia's Near East, just as Sir Robert Menzies subsequently referred to the Far East as Australia's Near North. This week marks my 20th year as a Member of Parliament. In my first speech back in 1994, I said there was no limit on what Australia could achieve. It was true then and it's true now, particularly given the economic circumstances of the countries to our north. The global middle class is projected to grow from 1.8 billion to over 3 billion by 2020, and most of that growth will occur in Asia. Asia will generate about half the growth in global output between now and 2030. There is, of course, no law of nature saying that the Asian middle class must buy the products of Australian manufacturers, must use our services, must study at our colleges or must visit our tourist destinations. Just because Asian countries have found Australia a good supplier in the past doesn't mean they will inevitably do so in the future. That's why this government is doing everything it can to complete free trade agreements with our top three export markets. While in Korea, I hope to witness the signing of the Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement. In Japan, I hope to help finalise the Japan-Australia FTA. And in China, I hope to announce substantial progress towards freer trade. This is the trifecta of trade we are working towards. The Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement will reduce or eliminate tariffs on key agricultural exports and will open opportunities for innovative service businesses well suited to compete in President Park's creative economy. We will open the doors, but Australian businesses will still have to walk through them in order to maximise the benefits of these arrangements in the same way that Hastings Funds Management, for instance, an infrastructure promoter, has opened an office in Seoul and is now in partnership with the Incheon International Airport Corporation. Because free trade agreements mean little without businesses willing to make the most of them. So accompanying this trip to our three 
largest trading partners will be a very senior business delegation indeed. My visit will also coincide with the inaugural Australia Week in China, to which Trade and Investment Minister Andrew Robb is leading the largest ever overseas business delegation from Australia. It will involve small, medium and large companies from across our country and across all sectors of our economy, including financial services, food and agribusiness and manufacturing. I'm pleased to say that it's likely that all six premiers will also participate. Australia Week in China represents an unprecedented level of focus and partnership with business in this key market where Australian exports increased by over $2 billion in just the last year. I want to say that the transformation of China is a watershed in human history. Lifting hundreds of millions of people into the middle class in just a generation is perhaps the most spectacular advance in human welfare ever accomplished. I congratulate the Chinese government and people on this remarkable achievement of which they are justly proud and am pleased that Australian coal and iron ore has helped to make it possible. It's hard to overstate the importance and the strength of Australia's relationship with China. China is now by far our largest trading partner. In some years it's our largest source of immigrants and in most years it's our largest source of foreign tourists and students. As liberalisation spreads from the economy into other elements of Chinese life, I am confident that Australia will be a valued friend and strategic partner as well as a rock-solid reliable economic partner to the Chinese people and government. Of course, China's achievement mirrors Japan's and Korea's some decades earlier, only on a larger scale. Japan and Korea have been strong economies, strong democracies, as well as powerhouse economies for decades. I honour the Japanese and the Korean people not only for their economic achievements, but for their steadfast commitment to liberal democratic values. Indeed, Australia's friendship with Japan has been one of the most mutually beneficial bilateral relationships in global history. Japan has been a key economic partner for almost six decades. Coal and iron ore were little more than cottage industries focused on domestic production until Japanese demand and investment turned them into global giants. Australia's post-war prosperity owes more to Japan than to any other country. Our business people have similar outlooks and our companies thrive in transparent markets. Australian and Japanese businesses are now working together throughout the region. For example, Australian architectural consulting firm PTW and engineering consultancy firm Meinhardt have both won contracts to work with Japan's Tokyo Corporation on the Binh Duong Newtown project in Vietnam. Japan's economic resurgence under Prime Minister Abe will be good for Japan, good for Australia and good for the world. But with a combined population of one and a half billion and a GDP of $15 trillion, China, Japan and Korea collectively have decisively shifted the world centre of economic gravity. For Australia, the tyranny of distance has given way to the advantage of proximity. Australia sells significantly more to these three markets than it does to the rest of our trading partners put together. From the custom-made Maiton guitar that accompanies Japanese singer-songwriter sensation Motohiro Hata, to the nine million Chinese using Baxter's skincare products, to the cell and tissue cultures manufactured by Serana, 
which are exported throughout Asia from the company's new production laboratory in Bunbury, Western Australia. And there will be new opportunities as President Xi drives China's transform transformation into a more market-driven and globally integrated economy, as President Park forges a more creative as well as a highly productive economy, and as Prime Minister Abe pursues market liberalisation to drive economic growth. It's telling that on the eve of my trip, Chinese and Japanese aircraft are together searching the southern Indian Ocean under the coordination of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. And Korean aircraft are also on their way. In the search for flight MH370, the countries of our region have demonstrated an ability to work together in a good cause. Deep down, what peoples have in common is always more important than anything that divides us. Certainly, we are all much stronger and more successful working together than working against each other. Australians are only too well aware that our prosperity depends upon the continued growth and strength of China, Japan and Korea. But for their part, China, Japan and Korea are among each other's largest trading partners too. And anything that damages any of them damages all of them. Obviously, my objective is to strengthen Australia's ties with all of our friends in North Asia. My predecessor, John Howard, often remarked that Australia did not have to choose between its history and its geography. My message is that making new friends doesn't mean losing old ones. This harmony was on display when the US and the Chinese presidents addressed the Commonwealth Parliament on successive days in 2003. And I hope that a Japanese Prime Minister might address our Parliament quite soon. On issues like counter-terrorism, nuclear non-proliferation, combating piracy and disaster relief, Australia's engagement with our North Asian partners is strong but can yet be deepened. I'll be looking for opportunities to work more effectively together on contemporary challenges such as maritime cooperation, cyber, food and energy security. Together with our United States ally, I hope to strengthen collective, political and security cooperation bilaterally and through regional institutions such as the East Asia Summit. As Australia and the nations of Asia engage in more trade, we will see a reinforcing cycle of investment, growth, innovation and prosperity. It would be an unspeakable tragedy were this ever to be jeopardised by territorial conflicts based on the shadows of the past. Now this year, not only sees Australia chairing the G20, but China chairing APEC. I am keen to work together in the cause of freer trade, more efficient markets, more effective regulation, more modern infrastructure and more widely shared prosperity. It was in fact another coalition external affairs minister, Sir Percy Spender, who said, and I quote, our future, Australia's future, depends to an ever increasing degree upon the political stability of our Asian neighbours, upon the economic well-being of Asian people and upon the development of understanding and friendly relations between Australia and Asia. Spender's insight led to the Colombo Plan, which brought the best, the best and the brightest students from Asia to Australia to study at our universities. Australia has much to teach the world, but much to learn as well, especially from Asia. Six decades 
after Spender, the new Australian government is completing this circle by sending Australia's best and brightest to study at universities in our region. It is our mark of respect for our regional partners. And in Japan, I will launch the first pilot phase of the new two-way Colombo plan, which complements Prime Minister Abe's ambition to double the number of Japanese students studying abroad. Of course, for millions of Australians, the countries of Asia are family through ties of ancestry, marriage and migration. These bonds are to be nurtured as much as the bonds of trade and commerce. All these bonds rest on decades of strategic stability in our region. Australia's relationships with Japan, with South Korea and with China are not mutually exclusive but complementary. And Australia is strong enough to be a useful partner, but not so strong as to be a threatening one. We've been involved in many international conflicts, but we've never started one, and afterwards have always striven to turn enemies into friends. That's one of the reasons why I'm confident that the Asian century will be Australia's moment too. For much of our first century as a nation, Australia's leaders lamented our isolation from what they thought were the centres of world affairs. But how that has changed. We are not at the wrong end of the world, but the right one. We are in the right place, at the right time, with the right spirit. Australia will work with its partners to seize this moment. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to so many people who are leaders uh, in our country and leaders in developing closer bonds between our part of the world, uh, within our part of the world, and between our part of the world and the rest of the world. Uh, I look forward uh, to continuing dialogue with you and I hope that my exceedingly important upcoming trip uh, can continue to benefit from your help. Thank you.